It sometimes seems like changes in healthcare are moving at the speed of light. We slow things down a bit and look at changes in the treatment of heart disease. It is our Valentine's gift to you tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. We thought it was appropriate to have a program about questions of the heart on Valentine's Day. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Pick the best answer. What is the most powerful at reducing vascular and heart disease progression? One, a statin cholesterol reducer. Two, a one mile walk every day. Three, avoidance of fatty foods like eggs and bacon. Four, the regular intake of fish oil capsule. Or five, stopping smoking. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your questions about heart disease as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. I've written a sonnet for the love of my life, my wife, Joni. You should know that Grady is the name of the hospital in which we met, and the sign of Q is to say the patient is very sick. Happy Valentine's Day, Joni. While challenged all about the Grady life and learning how to listen, how to care, I learned to poke with needle, scalpel, knife, and how to treat someone in deep despair. The lectures, chapters, essays do explain how best to bring the patient back to health. When patient comes with heart attack and pain, how asthma boils and chills can strike with stealth. So, on a cancer floor with sign of Q, I met a nursing student on the ward. She had a golden heart, was kind and true. We share our lives, a quest, a smorgasbord. Dakota seasons, children four, best friend, no matter what. Our love will never end. Well, anyway, enough of that. <laughs> Joining us tonight uh, include Dr. Bruce Watt and Dr. Michael Hibbard of North Central Heart, Heart Hospital. Thank you both for joining us. Thank Thanks you. for having us. So it's Valentine's Day. Heart's, the heart is the center of the universe, right? I mean, isn't it the most important organ of the body? Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> and I would like to take this time to talk to my... No. Uh, <laughs> you did awesome. There. That's incredible for Valentine's. Oh, that was that. a... That was very good. She made a great supper for us tonight. Awesome. So I didn't buy her candy. I just sent... I wrote her a poem. Great. So um, you are both general cardiologists uh, or vascular cardiologists. I know you've had a specialty in vascular work, but I mean, how would you define uh, your work? Well, uh, both Mike and I are interventional cardiologists. Mike, by interventional training, came out of uh, the uh, Mayo Clinic and did an interventional year. Back in the old days, there was only a few places that were doing that. At the University of Wisconsin, where I was, they didn't have that, so we kind of trained and did it there because we didn't have interventional, but then progressed in it and learned through stewardship with Mike and other cardiologists. But you take boards in interventional cardiology. Yeah. So we're both interventional cardiologists, but a great deal of our practice is general cardiology as well. You, you have to realize how old we are, Rick. We, yes. we were been around ever since they discovered fire. So yeah. we, <laughs> but what is somewhat true is that the whole development of angioplasty, the very first one that was ever done, we take it as commonplace now, the first one was in 1978. Yeah, at Emory with, with or no, in Andreas, Yeah, Andreas Grunzik. Yeah, yeah. yeah Andreas Grunzik who uh, died in a plane crash only two, three years later, and he started this whole genre of intervention. And even when I started doing intervention, the stints that everybody hears about now, we developed those during my training years, and they weren't available just anywhere. 
And if you would have been around in some of the early days, you wouldn't have wanted one because they didn't have them perfected the way they are now. Right. So uh, you explain what a stent is or an angioplasty and a stent is. Bruce? Well, I, I usually explain it like you remember those old Chinese finger traps you used to get your finger in. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a cross-hatch design similar yeah. to that. And then it's mounted on a small, small, very small balloon, like a hot dog shape. And then that slips into the artery over wire, and then the balloon is inflated. And then the scaffolding of that stent goes out, just like a crosshatch design, like a, um, you know, the uh, fence, uh -huh. uh, corrugated fencing, that out pops, and it stays, and the balloon comes out, and the wire is pulled out, and the stent mm -hmm. is left inside. A lot of people worry, is that going to migrate, is it going to shift, is right. it going to fall out, gets embedded. Within two weeks within the artery, there's a nice smooth lining of cells right. that has incorporated that as a structure to hold the artery open. But there's, there, now there's drug eluding stents that they put in that, um, but they don't always put in the drug eluding stent. Is there a reason why you'd pick a one with a little bit of chemotherapy on it or drug eluding or the, where are we at with that the, now? Uh, the deal is, is that the Lord did not intend for us to go in and inflate balloons inside of your body. And so the mother nature wants to heal that just like any other wound. And the way the artery gets bigger, a lot of people have the idea that we, we uh, take the blockage out, but actually what we do is we stretch the artery and the artery wall actually tears. And the example I use is when you make those uh, dinner rolls that you whack on the side of the counter and it splits open, you know, yeah. to get the rolls out. Yeah. Well, that's basically what happens to your artery so it can expand. And then the stent provides a scaffolding for the new wall to, to grow. To and we want that to be enough to cover the stainless steel but we don't want it to grow all the way back to the middle and so the drugs that are on the stents are used to, like chemotherapy for cancer to keep too many cells from growing in there and uh, it's pretty amazing physics actually because those drugs elude off over the first two to three weeks when they're put in and then they're they're gone so they go in they, they um, take care of the overdrive stimulation of healing and they get it to heal just enough if it if it works out right which it does 94 or so percent of the time. 6% um, of the time, maybe there's too much scar tissue builds up and then we have to go back and re do some work. But uh, it's a pretty excellent solution considering some of the, the uh, type of problems that people get. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it now in arteries going to the legs when they have, uh, particularly diabetics, have leg blood flow problems and then ulcers and... Uh, you, you might be amazed to realize and I'd be surprised if your viewers know that in your body you have 60,000 miles of blood vessels in the human body between the soles of those shoes you're wearing tonight and your haircut. And the heart pumps 2,000 gallons through that 60,000 miles every day of your life. That's that's an that's an amazing. And you're in charge of the highway department. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's happening automatically. I have no idea what's going on. But now the, uh, the 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 angioplasty first developed, and then the stents to improve the angioplasty. But before that, and since people have been doing bypass surgery, right. to explain that, what uh, and and what has improved on that? How has that changed? Well, the, the coronary artery bypass uh, grafting uh, is uh, still utilized a lot less than it was in the past. Uh, but bypass grafting uh, is utilized for complex anatomy. Not everybody's artery is just nice and straight with a focal little area that you can put a stent in and have a nice result. There's a mass of different complicating bifurcations. There's uh, arteries that we prefer not to, like a left main artery. Right. All of them really technically, every situation could be attempted with a stent, but what we decide to attempt with a stent versus what we decide to go to surgery with has a lot of factors that weigh into it. Uh, age and ability of the patient, the ability to get through an operation, um, the complex factors of medication compliance, a lot of different issues, but still utilized. And a very great operation, I always tell my patients when we're making the tough decision, go to a stent or maybe we should go to bypass surgery, is if I could wave a wand and have an internal mammary artery which is taken off of the chest wall yeah. and is an alive artery and can last for 30, 40 years, wave my wand and have that put in you, I'd like that. Yeah. But it's a big wand to wave and sometimes we Doesn't have work. issues that we've got to 
deal with it, it prefers stent over surgery or surgery over stent. And uh, the way they used to do it uh, early on before the internal mammary was from grafts from the veins of the legs. Exactly. But uh, veins aren't, aren't as strong and tough as arteries. Right. The, the, the veins, uh, you know, they, they incorporate uh, vessels that feed them and keep them alive, uh, little vessels called the vasovasorum, and they get cut when it's put in. And yeah. then it's more of just a graft, and they can degenerate over time. Whereas if you have a living artery that is hooked to the heart, it's that a better is deal. intact and it stays alive. Yeah. yeah. We've got some questions. Uh, there was a question about lisinopril, um, uh, side effects from lisinopril. Mike? Well, um, first, let me say that all drugs have side effects. There, if you got out the uh, Google machine and you looked up aspirin, you probably wouldn't take one because of all the things that you can, you can have. Lisinopril actually is a very commonly used drug in cardiology because it has tremendous advantages in heart failure. It decreases um, left ventricular hypertrophy. Great drug. It's a terrific drug and it's cheap, it's generic, um, and for People that do have 92 million people in the United States have hypertension, and there's only 347 million in the country. And so, um, and they just changed the guidelines, as Bruce was saying. So now 40% of the United States population has high blood pressure. And they, they don't understand the ramifications of that. And what I, I tell people is if I was lifting barbells 100,000 times a day, what do you think my muscles are going to look like? And that's what happens to your heart muscle. So to get an idea of what your heart does during your lifetime, forget about heart physiology, forget about medical school. Only thing you've got to do to stay alive is hit a tennis ball off the wall 100,000 times a day. Do you think you would get tennis elbow, rheumatism, <laughs> arthritis? <laughs> right. And so your heart muscle gets like pound steak instead of filet mignon. When you're young, it sucks the blood right out of your lungs. But as you get older, it gets a little stiffer, just like getting gray hair and wrinkles that yeah. everybody gets. And so you need that li lisinopril to keep you from getting that, uh, having those. But it has side effects. It has side effects. The most common one I would say is a cough. Uh, ACE inhibitor cough is what it's called, and it happens at about 7% or so of people. And there's a second generation of those drugs that you can take, and it affects some hormones in your lungs that makes your bronchial tubes irritating. And, it, and it, you get what I refer to as the opera cough. You <coughs> Before the movie starts, you know, people mm -hmm. don't need to cough, yeah. but they just clear their throat <laughs> yeah. or before you speak. It's that kind of a cough. So you're not going to get cancer. You're not going to get asthma. It's just a nuisance, and they do have some other solutions that you can use. All right. Alternatives. Alternatives, yeah. Right. Having heart problems is a scary situation. That stress is increased when you have those problems while away from home and are traveling. Here is a story of just that situation. There were six of us, um, some friends and some relatives, both. And uh, we were about five days into the vacation. And everybody had been sick except me and my brother-in-law. On about the fifth morning, I woke up, got up as normal, read the paper. Um, I was getting ready for the day and started feeling strange. Um, very strange. Started having pain up across my chest, up across the upper part of it, from about my breastbone and radiated to my shoulders. And then uh, also some feeling like I was going to throw up. Um, and the fact that everybody had been sick made me think maybe it was just my turn to be sick. Um, Soon it was pretty obvious that it was more than that and um, decided that maybe we should have it checked out at an emergency room. It was a little bit challenging to figure out where to go. And I would say to anybody that travels, if you have Google and Google Maps on your phone, it literally could be a lifesaver. So after we believed Brian that he really needed to go to the emergency room because we had all been sick and, and we truly did think it was just his turn, but he was very smart and kept saying, I have to get to a hospital. They were top notch and they, they took one look at Brian and knew exactly what was going on and um, things just kind of flew. They did the appropriate tests right then 
and said that he was having a heart attack and that he needed to get to their main facility, downtown Honolulu, to have a stent put in, to get into the cath lab and have a stent. And, and we're like, wow, the traffic here is so bad. How is that going to happen? And they assured us that with uh, the ambulance and all the lights and sirens that the waters part, and they do. They just went ahead and, and took care of me, figured out I had a blockage, where the blockage was, and put in a stent, and slam bam, it was over. I have been to well, on one other short trip since, since this all happened, and honestly, I do pay attention to where the H signs are now. You know, you drive down the highway, and there's a nice blue sign with a white H on there, and I do have to say, I paid a little more attention this time. I remember on the drive, I kept thinking, boy, I wish I was going to the Brookings Hospital because, you know, it's right here in town. The system knows us. We know them. It wasn't a terrible experience. It was probably more difficult for Lynn than for me and maybe some of our uh, fellow travelers uh, having to kind of messed up some of their plans a little bit, changed their plans a little bit. But um, for myself, I received great care, felt like I was in competent hands, and uh, I thank them for all their efforts. Thank you, Brian and Lynn, dear friends. and. Uh, they have cardiologists now in, in, their, in the state, uh, one of which is in the, in the room with me right now, taking care of and looking over him. This is your program, and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion. So please, call in your questions to 1-888-3766-225, or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. And we've got some questions. A Groton woman said, I've had two stress related heart attacks in the last 11 years, but no blockages were found and no stents were required. Stress related. What could be causing these heart attacks? Could a gallstone stuck in a bile duct be enough stress to cause a heart attack? What happened before the second heart attack? Yeah. So, uh, you know, there, there are, used to be Prince, Prince Metals angina, right? Right, right. Tell so, me what that is and, and, sure. and explain no vascular, you know, no blockage right, type heart attack. Right. We've uh, had a number of patients that have uh, coronary artery spasm where the artery is, uh, has a real nice lining of smooth muscle around it and under certain conditions, uh, mental stress, uh, temperature stress, breathing in cold air can result in some coronary spasm. But there's a pattern of real repetitive, severe chest pressure tightness in these patients. Oftentimes at rest, it's not exercise related because the blockage isn't fixed. But the triggering mechanism sometimes is emotional stress. And it can be causing a constriction of the artery, which limits the blood flow and can recreate angina. It has characteristic changes on an electrocardiogram. That's why it's important if you're having those kind of episodes that you're, well, A, if you have any chest pains like that, get to the emergency room. Right. But to actually document and tell what's going on with particularly the Prince Metals angina yeah. or coronary spasm, you need that EKG showing a characteristic EKG change that is associated with do, it. Do you use nitroglycerin or what, uh, what do you do for Prince Metals angina nowadays? It's still, uh, nitroglycerin is a good therapy. Uh, Long-term management, the calcium channel blockers like amlodipine yeah. and things like that seem to have have a real good response and uh, sometimes you know I've had patients that have put up with it their whole life and they thought it's just anxiety and it turns out it was coronary spasm all that time Wow! so yeah. uh, you know there's other emotional things that can cause heart trouble uh, tell me about takosabu or takosubo Tako takosubo it's a Japanese term they used to use these uh, pots to catch octopi and they, they have a narrow neck so the octopus goes in and it gets stuck in there and it can't get back out. And what happens is when you get this is a big emotional surge, terrible news. I saw somebody that in the old times they used to do ECT where they would do electroshock therapy. I saw somebody after that, shock on the system. And um, it has to do with big neural discharge. 
and though the mycocapillaries don't um, get the circulation like they should, and it looks everything like a heart attack except it doesn't follow the usual anatomy of the arteries that supply the heart, which is the clue that it's that it's truly a stress cardiomyopathy, which is a little bit different than the Prince Metal's angina yeah. that you were talking about, which is the main pipe artery being uh, in spasm. But it, isn't it interesting that the emotions, you know, really do. Here uh, we are on Valentine's Day right. talking about emotional affairs. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, a woman from Wall is wondering how many times can they do a cardioversion on a person that has atrial fib? Atrial fib first, what is atrial fib? Well, atrial, atrial fibrillation, I like to explain it, the atrium, or the attic of the heart, we have two atrium, the two upper chambers and the two lower chambers of the ventricle. Two bedrooms upstairs. Two bedrooms upstairs, they're the receiving end, get the blood back from the heart and blood back from the lungs, but they beat in coordination with the lower chambers, boom, 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 boom. So that is a nice regular rhythm. If you go into atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers are literally fibrillating very fast, 1,000 beats a minute, just vibrating and sending a very erratic signal. Still gets from the atrium to the below, but it's fast, sometimes 170, 180 beats per minute, like a fish flopping out of water, not boom, 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 but it's very erratic. Oh, I've never very heard fast. fish flopping as a yeah, that's that's good description. I said that, that's, that's, that's yeah. it. But anyway, it's, uh, it, it can create havoc because you need, you know, some people have this for two, three months at a time, and they come in, they're short of breath, it's like they've been running a race forever. But the atrial fibrillation is, uh, is what's causing the shortness of breath. And, and, she was, uh, and she was asking about doing cardioversion for right. atrial fib. How many right. times and, right. it, it, you know, there's a lot of debate about just leaving them in atrial fib, right. bringing the rate down, anticoagulating them, because you're gonna anticoagulate them anyway. Right. And then you're going to start them on a slower rate drug anyway. Right. Some people right. say you do just as well not cardioverting them. Actually, you're absolutely right, but a little bit off is that if you take two groups of people, have atrial fib, and you spend a lot of effort to get one group to go regular like the Lord intended, and the other group you leave, like you said, in atrial fib with uh, anticoagulants, they both win the lottery the same number of times. They have go on the same number of dates. They um, have the same number of speeding tickets, everything is the same, except the reason you go through a lot of effort to, to convert one is because they have symptoms. They're out of breath, they're dizzy, they're lightheaded, they don't like the palpitations and irregularity, but functionally they come out the same as far as prognosis, it's just that they feel poorly, and that's why we exhaust effort to get them regular. You, will you lose 10 percent ejection fraction or something? Actually, like you, if you have a stiff heart, which is main, the main cause of this, uh, you can lose up to 25 percent of your cardiac output because that stiff ventricle that I told about mm -hmm. from hypertension, and we talked about taking care of that, probably the most common cause is hypertension for atrial fib, and that's because hypertension is so common, come back in 15, 20, 30 years, and then you're going to develop the atrial fib. And you know, the new one that, that really came upon our reality maybe five or ten years ago is sleep apnea being a big yeah. cause for atrial fib. You sleep a quarter of your life or 20 percent. It has to be high quality like everything else to make it. Yeah. That's an interventional cardiologist, 20 percent. 20 percent. should be sleeping 33 percent, right? Eight <laughs> hours a day. So. 33 percent. That's right, 33 percent. If you're a cardiologist, 20 percent. Okay. That's right, all right. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, all right, a person from Sioux Falls is uh, uh, recently diagnosed uh, with an enlarged aortic root, okay, 41 millimeters. What causes that, and at what point does the problem need to be addressed, and how can it be fixed? How common is this? So an enlarged aortic root. Now we know about a dilated aorta being an aortic aneurysm, but this is, that's like in the abdomen. But an aortic root is all the way up to where the aorta exits from the heart. What, what's, what's that? Again, it's, uh, you know, it's on a continuum. Uh, you know, 41 millimeters, you know, our root should be in that 37 to 38 maximum. And over time, the most common cause is, again, hypertension, the pounding of the systolic yeah. blood pressure against that root. There are other uh, conditions that can be congenital, aortic valve abnormalities, and people with actual conditions that weaken the collagen within the aorta, the sidewalls, and can weaken it and cause them to be susceptible to enlargement. 
but a lot of those things have to be factored into it. But it needs to be watched on a regular basis, yeah. see if it's stable or unstable. And if it's growing at a rapid rate or approaching five centimeters, you're talking about getting closer to an operation. And it depends upon what the valve looks like, a lot of things. But it's, it's, it's worth watching. It's worth treating your hypertension if you have it. Uh, 41 is just kind of the entry point of abnormal, and it yeah. needs to be watched. I had a 78-year-old gentleman have a quite a large dilation of his aortic root, and I sent him to you guys. I, I think you might have seen him, Mike. I, I can't remember. It might have been you, Bruce. But uh, you guys elected to watch him, and he died just recently at 94 or some darn thing, you know, uh, from uh, sudden death. But it was... Certainly the aortic root wasn't the problem. I mean, it was a monitored deal. Did the repair, for, and the thing we talked about is about the size where you would consider intervening. Usually the aneurysm will enlarge about a tenth of a millimeter, about a millimeter, I should say, a year or every two years. And so you're talking about abdominal slowly. aorta too? I mean, it, it, no, the deal is, is your blood vessel system uh, is not the same everywhere. And the reason that this aortic root aneurysm takes on a lot more significance is because it's right next to the business end of the valve. Yeah. So the, the, sometimes the enlargement of the aorta is not the thing that drives the decision about whether to operate because if the valve gets pulled apart too far, then it starts to leak. And if it leaks a lot, then the heart tries to throw the blood up. To It's kind of like pumping the old cistern with the water running back down the well, you're going like this, yeah. and the heart has to do all this extra work, so that makes the thing dilate even faster, and the more the dilation, the more it leaks, and so then you need a valve plus a conduit to repair the aneurysm and the valve. Boy, that's a that's Yeah, a it's a very one. big operation, which is why they might have elected at a certain age to say you're better off just, just watching watch this it. than mm -hmm. to do a big surgery. Yeah. What about, and I think we'll take this opportunity to talk about abdominal aortic aneurysm. People talk about screening, these ultrasound screening things, people come into town. I think that's the only good thing about those is to do a screening ultrasound of the abdominal aorta, but you should be doing that with what? Any, man, any person who's smoked ever, particularly if you're a man, at the age of 60 to 70 or something like that? What's the screen? Do you remember? Well, they, well, they, they uh, Medicare guidelines, you know, they'll cover and you're welcome to Medicare uh, screening at age 65, any male smoker or hypertensive. Yeah. And, or if you have a primary relative that's had an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And I agree with you. I mean, these screening exams, uh, really they're marketing ploys. Yes. But I find it very advantageous as a very reassuring mechanism for me who's seen patients that actually have these diseases, yes. not the general pop, to say, well, you're a smoker, let's get this, let's see where your carotids are, let's yeah. look at the plaque burden, let's look at the aggressiveness of the level of treatment. But um, we have to be cautious with the screenings. Yeah. It can, I, can I, get out of hand. I agree. What is the time that an abdominal aorta needs to be approached? And we can do it now not uh, almost without like a heart stent thing too. Right, right. We've gotten very good about putting these things called endoluminal stent grafts in to repair these aortas. It's usually around a size of five or so centimeters, but the thing is, is you have to take into account how big the person is. So if you're one of these six foot eight linebackers from the NFL, five centimeters isn't so big for you, but if you're a five foot inch woman, and you have one that's four and a half centimeters, that might be a very big aneurysm. Yeah. So you have to take into account what the, the size of the person is. It's not like a cookbook or a caliper deal. So you're not gonna give me a number. I think that's a fair, an average size male? RDA man, the average registered, di you know, 180 and six foot yeah. is a five centimeters is about the time. And then it depends on what other thing, what other risks and uh, a variety of other things. But that's in general the size where you start to need to think about doing but it, something. It, it's amazing how smoking is a big, big factor on abdominal aortic aneurysm. I, I lost a dear friend, you know, he was a smoker and, and I, you know, I'm, he's I'm following him, I followed him for years and years, we were dear friends. He, he came in the emergency room one night in distress and of course got shipped and they opened him up and he event and they just didn't get it early enough and he died on the table. The, the thing is about now, if you have an aneurysm that's rupturing and we repair a lot of these in Sioux Falls, before they had these endoluminal grafts, <clears throat> if you ruptured your aneurysm on the street, 50% death. Yeah. 
just dead. That doesn't count living with a lot of disability, I mean dead. And now they can go in with a balloon right away and tamponade the blood flow and give people time to, uh, you know, let, and they could put it so that the kidneys can still get the blood. Yes. And they don't have to do a big open procedure anymore. They do it all through your legs. And they can isolate the bleeding and, uh, wow. and uh, several uh, amazing success stories of people that had rupturing aneurysms, made it to the hospital, and because of the teams we have that they can get it repaired without getting a big operation. Tremendous advance in medicine. Yeah. You know? The changes in heart care that have happened over the years are amazing to anyone, but to those doctors who have to, have to learn the new treatments, it's even more profound. So cardiology is a field of medicine in which technology has played and continues to play an, a large role. Dr. Olson, what would you say is the biggest technological advance you've seen in the years that you've been practicing cardiology? Well, I started uh, practicing in 1991, and uh, in the field I work with the heart rhythms, uh, we work with defibrillator devices, and uh, initially these are devices that can treat or shock a rapid heart rhythm back to normal in people that have a more uh, you know, higher risk for like a cardiac arrest. So initially they were placed through a surgery, there were patches placed on the outside surface of the heart, the device was very large, was placed in the abdomen, the person was in the intensive care unit for a couple days or so, um, and then the hospital for about five to seven days. Now it's evolved to the defibrillators are generally placed up under the skin, under the collarbone area. The leads are placed in the heart primarily. People can come in one day and have it done and then often go home the next day resume normal activities within a few days. Mm -hmm. so there's been dramatic advances. There's a lot of um, uh, programming features that are available to treat rapid rhythms for uh, pacing, being able to pace the left side of the heart along with the right side of the heart to improve the heart function in so certain people that have heart weakness due to certain electrical problems. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Adams, the general trajectory we've mentioned has been smaller devices, less invasive procedures. Yeah. You brought a, an example of a new pacemaker, which looks a lot different from the old traditional devices. Oh, yeah. 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 Are there other things cut, coming down the line? I, or what's next, do you think, with cardiology and technology? So there's a lot of things going on in all of cardiology. Mm -hmm. So everything, like you say, is smaller, less invasive. We, they're putting in valves now. Mm -hmm. Initially, it started with aortic valve done through the artery. Used to be, well, it still is, but, mm -hmm. but um, you'd have to always open the chest for that. We're now doing mitral valves. There's some talk about tricuspid valves. Um, as far as ablation is concerned, there have been uh, some non-invasive ventricular ablations mm -hmm. that have been done where they do it with like a radiation type of technology. So completely non-invasive. Patient comes in, get their treatment, go home mm -hmm. the same day. Um, so everything is getting smaller, smarter, and less invasive, less time in the hospital with cardiology. Yeah, an exciting field to practice in for all these years and see that. Thanks. We really appreciate your questions. Keep calling them in. We had one question about uh, steroids, prednisone burst, uh, making the heart pound. Is that an uncommon thing and is it dangerous and, and what would you, be your thoughts? Um, again, I, I can't say I've encountered that a, a lot of times, but you know, theorizing what could happen, uh, prednisone can make you retain a little bit more sodium, which can lead a little bit higher blood pressure, a little bit more forceful beating of the heart. You might be, just be more cognizant of it, cognizant yeah. Of it yeah. um, especially people that maybe have mitral valve prolapse or something in the volume. What happens, so, I think, yeah. here a lot of the time is that the reason you're getting the prednisone is because there's some disturbance in the force. You know, you have asthma attack, or you have inflammation, or you have arthritis, or there's some other disruption in the body system. And so what that does is it puts everything under stress, and then you put some drugs into the milieu. So it's not too surprising that you would have some uh, uh, hard heart beating yeah. or some palpitations. Um, and, and you have to realize that those people are getting those drugs superimposed on however old they are and how much they've used their yeah. heart and whatever the other issues are that they have. Well, I, so it may not just be the prednisone, yeah, it may be right. the overall that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. That's overall uh, effect that it's yeah. having. Yeah. 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 Palpitations, you know, can wax and wane. We'll see patients 
one year, not see him for six years, and you get to the crux of what's going on, and there's something that's something in their been life stressful. That's, it's a yeah, change. Yeah. 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 I, I uh, have had bursts of prednisone with chemo, so that the prednisone would come with the chemo, and I went, nah, <laughs> I don't like this not sleeping for two mm -hmm. days. Uh, let's try a half, the, half the dose, see how I do. Well, half the dose felt better, but still, how about quarter of the dose, how about none? And I was, I was more comfortable with the side effects that were being covered up by the prednisone than with the side, with the effects, side effects of, of prednisone. the prednisone. Right. And so now we don't we don't want to get people to do you do you, do you often treat yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the oncologist oh, yeah, okay. and he was right, saying no, right, okay, right. we can cut it back. I I didn't do that on my own. Thank you. Okay. 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 <laughs> Thank you, doctor. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got great questions. I was taking lisinopril and my doctor switched me over to Losartan and I was wondering if it's better than lisinopril. It's basically similar. This goes to the question that we took earlier and I don't know if this person was watching then. But this is the drug that's commonly gone to if lisinopril gives you that uh, cough. That's the most common right. side effect right. from that. And they would use this losartan because it has a little bit of different uh, hormone action. And, and it doesn't almost does always very doesn't, similar doesn't, action. doesn't have the cough, but uh, does control the blood pressure and improves the heart function and everything. I had uh, an allergist, however, say to me one time, there is a significant lisinopril risk uh, of, uh, uh, and you, you know, this atypical re reaction to drugs we have with every drug, you know, that this could be an atypical thing that lisinopril has a significant amount of that. And I've had a few patients just get sick on uh, the lisinopril. So I think uh, switching to losartan is a good idea. A spearfish woman says, I have an appointment with a heart specialist for the first time next week. What kind of information should I bring with me? like prescriptions or meds or medical history or? Great question. I, I think, as always, we, we like patients to actually bring their medicines because sometimes it, a lot gets lost in translation. So it is nice to have the pill bottles there to go Put them in a it, brown paper bag. Bring them with you. Bring them with you. Right, right. And okay. think of, we always ask our patients, to think of three questions, you know, three, at least three questions you want to ask and, and have answered and just write it down so you just don't forget it. If there's something that you're really troubled about, right. and depending upon our complaint. You know. you know, docs really try to take, I think, time with their patients mostly, but it's so compressed now. And so a doctor visit is something I think you should really prepare for. And so when you go, write down the questions. Because you, you know how it is when you see your neighbor and you say, oh, geez, I forgot to ask you this. Yeah. Or I wish I, <laughs> and then you just walk out of the room and you forgot. So yeah. don't be afraid to write things down uh, so that when you come in and you have your time with the doctor, you yeah. really get the point across. I think that's really important. I totally agree with you. Although in med school, some people said, beware of the one who comes in with questions. I never... Uh, was beware. It just shows that you're organized. They're organized. Right. It's an right. appropriate thing. Brookings man asked, can you explain congestive heart failure? Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I like that one. Congestive heart failure, um, people, I just had a, today an example, um, a lady uh, wanted the diagnosis of congestive heart failure taken off of her chart because she didn't think she had it because her heart pumps fine. And again, yes. it gets back to the questions Mike was alluding to. The heart muscle can lose its elasticity in the presence of uh, having hypertension. And that's just one form of it. We call it diastolic, like the diastolic or lower number on the blood pressure. But that's the resting pressure inside of the heart is high and that pressure gets exerted every time that valve opens to let the blood in, gets exerted back to the lungs. And if that pressure gets up as high as 25 or 30 millimeters of mercury, that's enough to make the capillaries in the lungs start to weep a little bit of fluid, and then you, and you get short of breath, and then you get the right side of the heart gets under pressure, and like venous congestion, you start to get swelling, and a lot of the typical symptoms of congestive heart failure. You can get that same process if the pump doesn't work well, where it's not pumping well. That's systolic. That's failure. systolic. So that pump is not working good. It's under high pressure because it's overloaded, volume overloaded, right. and that same pressure exerts back to the lungs and makes you short of breath. Yeah. I, li I, I don't like the word failure. Yes. Uh, I wish we said heart pump weakness. I, I yes. like the word weakness, yes. not failure. One viewer wonders what effect does extended chemotherapy have on the heart, Mike? There. Uh, is a whole new um, specialty of cardiology that's just getting started. They just developed the first journal of what they call cardio-oncology. Because all these chemotherapy drugs go into the body and they create damage. They're basically trying to knock off the 
cancer cells that they want to get rid of, but there's all this collateral damage that can take place to other organs because these drugs are toxic. The people that deliver them come with gloves and they have in brown bags the yes. chemotherapy. <laughs> it's and not stuff. comforting to it's a guy getting chemotherapy. No, no. And the thing there. is, is I don't want to put anybody <laughs> off about getting the chemotherapy because there's all kind of safety, which is where this whole genre of cardiac oncology comes from. And then some of those people get radiation as well uh, and other drugs that they're taking anyway. And so all of that can create some uh, uh, troubles and difficulties for the heart. And then having somebody who's knowledgeable about all of those complex interactions to see to it that you get through with your chemo in unscathed so you don't trade one problem for another. That's really true. Adriamycin being the worst heart drug. Uh, one of the worst. We've got 18 questions, eight minutes. We gotta really scramble, quick answers. My husband had chest pains and shortness of breath, went to the ER, referred to a cardiologist. No blockages were found to discover an aortic valve leakage. Cardiologist said aortic regurge. Uh, they said it's not severe. What is does the future hold for a person with a, a, AI or AR, okay. aortic regurge? Uh, typically, if it's if it's a mild aortic regurgitation, uh, that's tolerated quite well. But why do they have the regurgitation? Getting back to what Mike said, aortic root is dilating, the valve is leaking. Be sure your hypertension is controlled, <clears throat> and that the AI is monitored. You yeah. don't want to wait until the heart muscle is starting to weaken it's a little too late. You want to watch it as long as the heart function is good and you're watching the severity and controlling the blood pressure. That's a, that's a good way to watch yep. it. Woman from Inwood, Iowa asks, how common is it to have a failed stent? It's only about 6% of the time. Is that, and a failed stent we usually talk about is that it builds up with scar tissue. Um, on the average now, that, that those are the statistics. It depends on how big the vessel is. You have a great big vessel, they come out better. The smaller the vessel, the harder they are to work on, which is a little bit in general terms why women are worse off with heart disease, because in general they're smaller. Sioux Falls woman says keeping my blood pressure regulated is an issue. Commonly 150, 160, over 60 to 70, pulse is 60 to 80, cardiac output is 65% on Xeralto and now have a CPAP, is there any way to lower the systolic number? I worry about eventually developing heart failure. The fatigue is really, really annoying. <clears throat> Do I just have to live with this? Multifaceted <clears throat> question, but she won't have to live with the systolic pressure. That can be effectively controlled. It's a, have the doctor really look at the medications. There's some that we're holding on to in certain situations that probably aren't as good at first line choices, but more along the lines of vasodilator therapies. You know, the lisinopril again. Good lisinopril choice. and even some of the, uh, you know, amlodipine calcium channel blockers right. as first line agents for kind of <laughs> tending to get a little bit more away from the beta blockers, except for we like them as cardiologists <coughs> for other reasons. Right. One viewer said you mentioned a stiff heart. What is a stiff heart? Say it again, explain. The deal is, is the example I use is the blood pressure ball that we all remember when they take your blood pressure. So everybody understands the squeezing part. That's how the blood gets pumped around. But what they don't forget is that the, or what most people forget is that the heart has to go back. So you just can't squeeze, it has to go back. And so when you're young, the heart sucks the blood right out of your lungs, just like uh, so and Yon, it's so elastic. But what happens is if it gets stiff, it's like taking that ball in the 30 below wind chill. You'll <laughs> squeeze it, but it doesn't want to come back. And then because of that, that pressure goes on your lungs and you'll get short of breath. Yeah. Uh, the, well, the question about blood pressure, very quickly, uh, in the elderly, uh, like, what, 65 or older? Sometimes, Ooh, well, sometimes. 80, 85. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, the, the, the blood pressure often is high when you're sitting there, but when it gets low when you stand up, you get lightheaded when you stand up, there's problems. Uh, do fish oil tablets really lower cholesterol? Uh, a complicated co question, yeah. but uh, it's, uh, it, you know, the uh, fish oil can work on triglycerides uh, a little bit, and it's, they're a little bit possibly falling out of favor. Okay, but they do help with dry eyes. There you go. I have an apical ischemia. Do I need to worry about that? What are the risks associated with it, and what is the prognosis? It's difficult to say because you don't know where the blockage is that causes that. If it's just out at the tip of the heart, it won't cause any trouble, but it's up at the proximal part. Uh, it'd be a big deal. So it's kind of like uh, the fuse box in your basement. You go in the basement and you cut one of the wires, you get the toaster. And you cut another wire <laughs> and you get the dining room lamp. But if you cut the right wire, the house goes dark.
Yeah. And that's a little bit the way it is to think about where is the blockage that's causing that. Yeah. So you need somebody to help you interpret You need to know the, the real anatomy. Yeah, exactly. And if they've done the anatomy and it's okay, then it's okay. Right. How can a person determine that they are in atrial fibrillation? Is there a way to monitor this yourself at home or are you, or if you're out and about? Uh, another great Fish question. Fish flopping in the... Yeah, in you know, and I tell some of my patients, you know, it's just a good idea just when you take your medicines in the morning or you do your daily check that you learn how to check the rhythm of your heart. And sometimes it can be as easy as that. There's certain nuances of certain types of rhythms you wouldn't pick up that way. Uh, there are a lot of great apps and a lot of technologies coming out of, uh, right. you know, your smartphone apps, these cardia apps. Yeah, There's you can be... You get you, a smartphone you, app yeah, and do that. You can yeah. even look at your rhythm. You need to have a doctor help you learn a little bit about it. And yeah. There we're, are ways you can monitor We're it. looking at that now. Uh, sorry, Bruce, for interrupting. No, that's so the deal is, is that they have a little thing. It's like a wafer, and it sticks on the back of your cell phone, and you put your thumbs on there. And if you have one, here they are, right there. <laughs> this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see that on the wow. video. That's the but you just lay that on the table, you put their thumbs Come on out. there, okay. and you can monitor your own rhythm, mm -hmm. and it costs about 60 bucks that mm -hmm. you would get one of these. Um, and we're looking, and the cell phone uh, <laughs> industry is now going to be getting into healthcare yeah. and uh, monitoring your heart rhythm and all the issues that come with that. that it's going to be very convenient. The atrial fib is an irregularly irregular. Now, many people have a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. So uh, and that's not atrial fib. That's if you can catch a regular rhythm in there and you tap your foot and you can mm -hmm. cap your foot, but not uh, being able to tap your foot to it. Is, right, the, is right. the clue I have. If the stool is dark, yet there is no visible blood, is there still concern that there is an aneurysm leaking in the digestive tract? Aneurysms almost never, not never, but almost never leak into the digestive tract. That's a separate issue that usually has 98% of the time is from bowel bleeding and not yeah. related that's to That's another aneurysm. story. Yeah, that's a different story. Thank okay. you. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Pick the best answer. What is the most powerful at reducing vascular and heart disease progression? A statin cholesterol reducer? A one-mile walk every day? Avoidance of fatty foods like eggs and bacon? The regular intake of fish oil capsule or stopping smoking? The answer is number two. A regular exercise program, a one-mile walk, and a 1998 lifestyle heart trial comparing exercise and no cholesterol drugs versus standard medical care, which included administrating cholesterol drugs, found 45% fewer heart attacks in the lifestyle group compared to the standard treatment. So hit the treadmill or track or walk around the neighborhood, whatever works best for you. It was Hilbert Vanderweide, Vanderweide who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Hilbert, and thank you for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. For more than 16 years, the Prairie Doc organization has endeavored to enhance health and diminish suffering by providing useful information based on honest science in a respectful and compassionate manner. Prairie Doc physicians and health professionals continue to answer your questions each week, creating a vast Prairie Doc library of medical information available to you and your family 24 hours a day. Make sure you don't miss a thing. Follow the Prairie Doc on Facebook and YouTube for free and easy access to the entire Prairie Doc library. A beautiful 90-year-old woman came into the emergency room after another fall. The last year had been tough for her as she had developed diastolic heart failure. Her weakness and breathlessness was helped some by diuretics, but she was troubled by extreme variations in blood pressure, high one moment and dangerously low the next. Also, she had calcified and somewhat tight aortic valve and was on a blood thinner for atrial fibrillation. Heart disease in the elderly includes a wide variety of conditions. The following is a partial list. Aging coronary arteries with blockage and subsequent heart attack can be challenging to diagnose because older people don't always have symptoms to allow intervention. Calcification of heart valves, especially the aortic valve, can occur with age when tightening of the valve causes progressive failure of the heart's capacity to push past that obstruction and do its work. Heart pump weakness involves both the systolic squeeze, which pushes blood flow out 
of the heart through arteries, and the diastolic relaxation, which allows blood flow from veins back into the heart. Heart weakness can result from either one or both, as aging heart muscle in the elderly becomes replaced by scar tissue. Extreme variation in blood pressure, high one moment and dangerously low the next, can be a sign of diastolic heart problems. The broken heart syndrome can be a reversible systolic heart weakness caused by severe and prolonged sorrow. Overactive blood clotting can develop in the elderly, causing dangerous blood clots to the coronary arteries, the brain, or anywhere. Experts say that up to 80% of all deaths in nursing homes result from blood clots. Falling can cause bleeding and fracture. Falling is often the result of heart disease in general and can happen when the blood pressure drops just after standing. Falls can also occur due to neurologic conditions, just plain inactivity, or too many medicines. If you get lightheaded when standing, tell your doctor and ask her or him to consider you might be on too many medicines. The risk of falling was simply too high to continue my 90-year-old patient on blood thinners. I stopped them and backed off a little on the diuretic, which could have been worsening her blood pressure drops and causing the falls. The age-old ethic came to mind, first of all, do no harm. Balancing the advantages and the harms of medicine in the elderly requires careful consideration and sometimes less is best. <clears throat> A big thank you to our guests, Bruce and Mike for volunteering to come to our studio in Jaeger Hall on the campus of South Dakota State University. There were many great questions we were not able to get to during our broadcast time. We will continue to answer those questions on our Facebook page right now following this program. Go to the Prairie Doc Facebook page. We'll be there shortly after this broadcast ends. This additional segment will also be posted on our website, prairiedoc.org, in the coming days. The flu has come to South Dakota with over 2,600 cases this season and almost 950 this week. Four people have died so far this year in South Dakota. The flu is dangerous. Protect yourself and get the flu vaccine. It's important not just for you, but to help protect those around you. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, happy Valentine's Day. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Lots of things change as we grow older, especially our eyes. The Aging Eye, next time On Call with the Prairie Doc. For more than a decade, Dr. Holm, in his role as the Prairie Doc, has emerged as a leader of healthcare education and communication in South Dakota and across the country. Every week, Dr. Holm and other medical professionals volunteer many hours to share science-based truth about healthcare on public television, on the radio, in our newspapers, and online. And best of all, everyone has free, easy access to the entire Prairie Doc Library. Hi, I'm Jennifer May of Rapid City. As a board member of the Healing Words Foundation, I ask you to consider making a donation. Please help us continue this important work. Go to prairiedoc.org and make a donation today. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information.
and by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota, and with ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, CoBank, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Brown Clinic, Black Hills Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Third District Medical Society, Seventh District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic Community Services Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swiftel Communications.